Our text this morning is from chap- Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 16. It should be a familiar one to him. It's a short excerpt from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which is, Je- which is Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. It's Jesus' longest sermon in the Bible, and this is an important part. You should be familiar with it because we talked about it. We talked about it just recently. It says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Lord, we ask you, God, as we look to your word, Father, that you would teach us and instruct us, God, that you would give us wisdom, Lord, and open our eyes to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible teaches that we are in a cosmic battle between two warring visions for the world. It's kind of, you know, the world is a complex place. It's multivaried. There's many things going on all the time. But if you really just boil everything down to the most essential parts. The most essential parts are that there is a battle going on for the world between two different forces, good versus evil, the kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of hell. Two different paths that lead to two different eternal destinies, two different spiritual destinies. One of the ways that the Bible talks about this kind of fundamental binary choice is it uses the analogy of light and darkness. Light in the Bible represents the truth. It represents the gospel. It represents life and eternal life. Darkness represents truth being concealed. It represents hopelessness and lostness and eternal lostness. So it says that we're to be the light of the world. What it is envisioning is that we are to be a city set on a hill, the light of the world, that we are out there in the world shining in the darkness. It does not say, no, that that we should be the light of the church. Or we should be, you know, you have a light, but keep it to yourself, right? The, the impression that this verse is giving us is that God has given us a light, and that light is intended to go shine in dark places. And so we're called to be God's message to the world, God's publication to the world of the truth and the realities of God's love, of God's faithfulness, that this world belongs to him. Now, what's interesting is you, if you look at at another one of the Gospels, in John chapter 8, one of Jesus' famous um, I am statements, he says in John 8 verse 12, he says, Jesus says, I am the light of the world, speaking in reference to himself. So he says in John 8, it says, Jesus is the light of the world. But here in Matthew 5, Jesus says, we are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. How is that? How does that work? Well, one of the analogies that we have to, to help understand that is it's kind of like the sun and the moon, right? We know that the moon doesn't have any light of its own. It doesn't give off its own light. It only reflects the light of the sun, the S-U-N, right? And so in, in the same way that the, the moon shines in the middle of the night because it's reflecting the light that is coming from the sun, in the same way we shine because we are his image bearers. We reflect God's light to the world around us. But you know, sometimes there's something called a lunar eclipse. A lunar eclipse is what happens when the earth moves between the sun and the moon and the moon goes dark and you can't see the moon because it's not reflecting. It's interesting that sometimes the same thing can happen in Christians' lives. God has called Christians to shine bright in the darkness, but sometimes the world gets in the way of that sun shining on us. And this is because we are given to temptation. Sometimes we fall into kind of a spiritual eclipse where either our love for the world or our fear of the world or something in relation to the world gets in the way of us doing what it is we're supposed to do, us shining bright for the kingdom. So sometimes, you know, people, there's, there's people who maybe call you uh, like an undercover Christian, right? This is a, a Christian who there's not really anything about your life that would indicate to anybody else that you're a Christian, uh, I remember one time, really kind of soon after I got saved, I was working at Nordstrom. I was a loss prevention agent, and I was, um, I was working with a girl who was one of my partners, and we went around Cashville Shop with me. There's like a lot of time to talk, and she was telling me that she's a Christian. And I said, you know what? I'm a Christian too. And she said, come on, dude. And I said, no, no, I am a Christian. She said, look, I'm, trying, I'm opening up to you. Like, don't make fun of me. Uh, and I'm like, no, I'm... A- Dude, there was not much I could do to convince her that I was a Christian. And the reason was because there was no light coming off of me in my life at that point. There was nothing to indicate to her that I sincerely believed in God. Because at that point in my life, I was a pretty worldly person. There wasn't, there wasn't very many signs. I wasn't imaging God. I wasn't shining brightly in the darkness. Sometimes, a lot of times, we kind of allow those things to be our realities. Maybe at your job, you're not known as somebody who stands for righteousness. 
Maybe it's because of the fear of the world. We don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to make any waves. We don't want to get in trouble with HR. We, you know, whatever it is, there's things in there. Sometimes it's laziness. Sometimes we just are apathetic. We just don't really care that much. Sometimes we've kind of bought into this separation that, that you know, the, the, our, our Christian lives should somehow be separate from our public lives or that they're not welcoming. So pick up on those indications. And sometimes we have a spiritual eclipse where the world is coming between us and God and we're not shining in the way that God has intended us to shine. I want to suggest to you that that's actually very dangerous. Not only is it dangerous for the world, right? Because a lot of times we think about, man, if, if we're not out there shining for the world, how are they ever going to know the truth? But I want to suggest this morning, at least in part, that it's also dangerous for you. It's dangerous for you not to shine in the darkness. It's dangerous for us just to, to come to church here and hear the message and hear the word and then not go out and put it into practice in our lives. Something bad happens in us when that happens. It's kind of like uh, the Salton Sea, okay? Uh, last night I gave this illustration and somebody came up afterwards and they're like, let me give you the history of the Salton Sea. And they, it was very boring. Um, anyways... <laughs> The main idea between the Salton Sea is that, you know, in the 1800s and before that, the Salton Sea was just a a dry riverbed. There was no water in it. But because they had brought these aqueducts down into Imperial Valley and um, they began to overflow and the levees overflow and it broke and it filled up the Salton Sea. But if you go there, one of the problems is there's nowhere for the water to go. And so it just ends up being this, you know, all these, these waters come from the aqueducts and, and fill the the Salton Sea, but there's, there's nothing leaving it. And so it just turns into this really like, like toxic bog, okay? So like if you go down there, you just see there's like dead fish everywhere and it's just kind of this really gross place. It's kind of smelly. And you know, sometimes when we just are taking in, but we're not, nothing's going out, we can become like that. If you just come to church, one of our, one of our jobs is, as pastors is to be shepherds over the congregation. So one of the things that's important to us, one of the things that we're thinking about regularly is how is our congregation doing? How are the people in our church, you know, are they, are they growing spiritually? Are they walking with God? Are they hearing from the Lord? And so one of the ways that, that we intend to help shepherd the people of God and feed the sheep is, is we work on these sermons and we prepare these, these messages. And, and when, I was, when I work on sermons and when our other pastors work on sermons, we're hoping and believing that there's going to be something in there that you're going to learn, that God's going to use to speak to you, that God's going to challenge you, and that you're going to grow. And so when we come here on Sundays, one of the things we're doing is we're coming together as the people of God to be faithful and, and join in corporate worship and, and honor God and, and, and glorify him in thanksgiving. But one of the other things we're doing is we're coming here to get instruction. We're coming here to learn. And, and one of the problems, one of the things we worry about sometimes is, man, if you just come here and are learning all the time, but you're not actually doing it, there's something like we become like the salt and sea. We become like a bog. I like what Francis Chan said a long time ago. He said, you know, when I tell my kids that I want them to go clean their room, what I don't want them to do is go back to their room and say, let's talk about what it is that dad said. You know, he said, he said, clean your room. Man, I agree with them. Man, a clean room is so important, you know, and, uh, and just, you know, the discipline, the hard work of cleaning your room is really good. We really appreciate that. And then your dad comes in an hour later and he says, hey, what happened? He said, dad, we, we were talking about what you said. We thought about what you said. We think, man, you were spot on with that. That's brilliant. Clean our room. That's great. No, you're going to get in trouble. You're going to get spanked because the dad said, clean your room. He doesn't want you to think about how, what does it mean in the Greek, right? He doesn't want you to just sit down and, and work it around and chew on it. He wants you to go do it. And that's how it is with the word of God. God wants us to be doers of the word. Look what it says in James 1, 22 and 20, 25. It says, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. When you hear the word and you're not a doer of the word, you delude yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. If you are the kind of person who is a doer of the word, the Bible says you will be blessed in all that you do. If you want God's hand to be on your life, if you want to have God's sense of pleasure and that he's walking with you, then not, not only do you need to be a hearer of the word, but you need to be a doer of the word. It's dangerous just to be a hearer and not a doer. It says in Luke 8, 16 through 18, it says, Now no one after lighting a lamp covers it over with a container. This is a parallel verse of the Matthew 5 verse we read. No one lighting a lamp covers it over the container or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see it. 
For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret which will not be known and come to light. So take care how you listen. Listen, this is a little tricky how he words this, but I want you to hear it. So take care how you listen. For whoever has, to him more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, shall be taken away from him. It says here that, that if you are a careful listener and you don't, you don't light your lamp and then just go hide it, but you let it shine, to him more will be given. God will bring blessing and increase to your life. But... To him who does not listen well and does not hear well and does not become a doer of the word, even what he thinks he has will be taken away from him. So this is about us. This isn't even, forget just for a minute for the world we're going out that we want to rescue and want to be a light to. Just for us, if we're not the kind of people who are going out, there's something spiritually toxic that happens to us. There's something there where where our faith will begin to wane and will begin to fade and will become become, uh, like stuck, you know? If you're not growing spiritually, you're dying spiritually. Acting on the word of God is the secret to spiritual growth. If you want to grow spiritually in your life, begin to put into action the things it is that God is speaking to you. Begin to walk out those things that God has for you. Okay, so in this series, as we're talking about taking the church into the wild, not just coming out and being separate and having our own little Christian club, but going into the world to make Christ known, to shining bright, to go into the wild. This morning, I'd like to give you three things, three steps to thriving in the wild. These are three areas that that are, I think, important steps for us to be successful in the wild. As we get into it, one of the things I want to point out is is that we live in God's world, okay? This is his world. We, we live in our Father's world. He owns everything. He's powerful beyond imagination. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's, he's, he has all the strength, all the power, all the might. If he's for us, who could be against us, right? That's the God that we serve. And so we're talking about being obedient to him. We, should, we need to do it with the knowledge that he is our strength, that he's our power. I think sometimes Christians we tend to be scared when we go out into the world. We tend to be like, like a small ant, like a little baby bunny who's put into a new enclosure, right? And we're hiding because we don't know what's out there. We don't know what could hurt us. We don't know what could eat us. And so we're trying to not breathe. Every little crack, every little rustling in the bush is scary to us. And so we just try to be as small and as quiet as possible. You know, there's other animals. You think about an apex predator, Okay, an apex predator gets put into a new enclosure, like an orca or like a tiger, right? They're, they're the top of the food chain. There's nothing above them. They get put into an enclosure, and they're also trying to be quiet. Because, but for a different reason, right? They're trying to think, what is in here that I can eat? What is in here that I can kill, right? Because they're not scared of something bad happening to them. They're the ones who are going to go do something bad. You know, I think sometimes we have to think of ourselves as an apex predator, that we have God's power with us. We are like a T-Rex, right? You put a T-Rex somewhere, the T-Rex isn't worried. The T-Rex isn't scared. The T-Rex is hungry. He's looking, man, how can I go out and how can I accomplish these purposes? And when we have God on our side, we should have the attitude, we should have the confidence of a T-Rex. And so that's how God has intended us to be in the world. So we go into the wild. Don't be a little scared bunny rabbit. Think of yourself as a T-Rex. If he's for us, who could be against? Whom shall I fear? The Lord is on my side. I'm obeying him. And so when you're walking in obedience, you can have that confidence. (coughs) So here's what we, here's I think the first step of the three. The first step is identify your field. Where is your field? You know, oftentimes I think when I got saved, I was under the impression, man, if I want to, really live an exciting life for God that, that I got to go to like Papua New Guinea or somewhere in minister to Aborigines where there's no air conditioning and there's, there's no indoor plumbing and, and, um, and I'm going to die of dysentery or something. Like that's like the real adventurous Christian life. Well, I want to say that's not true. You know, um, God has intended for you to live an adventurous Christian life right where you're at. He's intended for the abundant life that Christ came to give you to be lived out right where you're at. In fact, the whole, the, the kingdom of God would fall apart if we all tried to go out and be Indiana Jones in, on the mission field, okay? God intends you to be Indiana Jones right where you're at, where you go. Uh, Pastor Jim had a great uh, quote this week in, in, the, in the Bible study he wrote for our home groups. He said, um, when, when go doesn't mean leave. 
When go doesn't mean leave. You know, you read uh, in, in Matthew 28 where it says, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Well, for the, the apostles who were hearing that, it did mean partially to go into these other places. But when we hear God say go, it doesn't mean you have to go uh, uh, across the world to minister. It means you have to go across the street to your neighbor's house. It means you have to go to work. You have to go to your kid's area and, and bring the light there. Be a city set on a hill there, right there in the place where God has put you. God has called you to be faithful right there. Mo usually the place that God wants us to work, the place that God wants to send us as missionaries and emissaries is to the place he already has opened doors for us. The place we already have. I like this uh, in, in 2 Samuel verse 20, chapter 23. It's a list of David's mighty men. These are these are mighty warriors who had fame and acclaim because they had they'd accomplished these great deeds. And, and David had this list of his lieutenants, these guys that were in his army who had just done these amazing things. And, and I, like, uh, in, I like one of them in, in 2 Samuel 23, verse 11, 12, it says, now, the, now after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, a Herorite. And the Philistines were gathered into a troop where there was a plot of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines, but he took his stand in the midst of the plot, defended it, and struck the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great victory. I love this story because of just some of the details we get. We, it says there's this guy, Shema, and that this garrison of Philistine soldiers came against the people. Everybody else fled, but Shema stood his ground, and he slayed them, and he got a great victory. The thing I love about it is it adds that it was in a field of lentils, okay? I like that because I, I like to think that, that Shema had, this was his field that he had planted these lentils, he had watered the lentils, he was getting excited about eating the lentils, and when the Philistines showed up, he just thought, they're not getting my lentils. <laughs> this is my field. God gave me this field. I'm, I'm taking my stand here. I'm not gonna let these dirty Philistines eat my lentils. And, and I, I just like that because he took ownership of it. It felt like, no, this is mine. I'm not running away. I'm not going anywhere. I'm gonna stand and fight because God has given me this field. And so I want to ask the question, what is the field that God has given you? What is the area that God has put you that he wants you to take that kind of ownership over? He wants you to take that kind of responsibility for it. Say, no, no, these are my lentils. This is my field. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to take my stand here. You know, I think sometimes we kind of get in our mind that we, maybe, and maybe it's just like a, an excuse making that you say like, well, I don't know. I don't feel like I have responsibility. Say, Let me explain to you at least part of this, the way I think this works. God has put us intentionally places where we are for a reason. Oftentimes we don't know what the reason is, but God has put us there and he wants us in that moment to shine like, um, like the lamp. Now, the, the way this works is that like, if you're, I can tell you this, if you're married, if you have a husband or wife, I can tell you for sure that God has given you your husband or God has given you your wife. Now, I can say that without knowing how it is that you guys actually came together, okay? Some of you guys in here, man, you waited patiently, you sought the Lord, you prayed hard, you got counsel, you did everything you could possibly figure out to say, how is it, who is the woman that I should marry, and is this the right woman, or is this the right man? Some of you did not do any of that, okay? Some of you, if you told us how you guys came together, it'd be very scandalous and <laughs> sordid, okay? The details would be very interesting, and, and I, can, I can just though blanket say to everybody in here, no matter how it is you came together, God gave you that husband or God gave you that wife. In the same way that, that if you have a child out, you know, out of wedlock, the, the circumstances surrounding you having that child might have been sinful. It might have been in rebellion and disobedience against God, against God. But I can guarantee you that God has given you that child. He gave you that child for you to be faithful and for you to be responsible with that child. God does not need you to, to go about perfectly and walk out and do all the perfect steps and do everything right and do everything by faith to get you where it is that he wants you to be. We can, we can look at that with marriage. We can look at that with, with children. But the same thing is true with your job. You might hate your job. You might every day be looking for a new job. But I want to tell you right now, God has given you the job that you have for you to be faithful with right now. Or your neighborhood, wherever God is, you might be wanting to move out, but wherever God has put you, that's where God has called you to be faithful right now. It doesn't mean it can't change, but God has given it to you as your field. He's given you that relationship. He's given you that place, and he wants you to be faithful in that place to walk out what it is he's called you to do. He wants you to shine your light and be a light in the dark places. So the first question is just, man, where do I have influence? Where has God already put me? Where has God already placed me so that I can 
walk out faithfulness and I can shine, I can be the light of God to a dark world. So the first thing, identify your field. The second thing is you got to count the cost. Because no matter what, the, there's always going to be a cost to being a light. It's always going to cost you something. Um, there's a, when I was first became a Christian, there's a book I read called In God's Underground by uh, a Romanian pastor. He's going to be uh, with the Lord, Richard Wormbrandt. He went on to start a ministry called Voice of the Martyrs that, that serves and resources uh, the persecuted church across the world. So in places like the Middle East and in North Korea and, and places where communism or Islam or Hinduism has, have oppressed Christians. And um, the reason he started that ministry is because of his own personal life. Being a pastor in Romania in post-World War II era when the communists took over all the Eastern European countries. And, and so Romania was part of the USSR. And as they were, they were um, bringing in communism, if you know historically anywhere that communism has ever risen, the Christians have always been persecuted. And the reason is because Christianity and, and communism cannot be reconciled. Uh, either, either the God is the living God who created the, the heavens and the earth, or God is the state. And for communism, God is the state. And so anything else that threatens that is a, is a problem. And so they're always um, at odds with each other. But there's always a coercive period in the beginning where they're trying to get the Christians to get on board and trying to use, they want to co-op religion to, communists always want to co-op religion to try to accomplish their purposes. And so this is what was happening in Romania. Stalin was in charge of Russia and, and he called a, a big uh, a meeting of all the churches, all the top leaders of the churches in Romania. The prime minister of Romania was there and, and Richard Wormbrandt, his wife Sabina were there. And they, they basically, it was this big uh, religious group to talk about um, you know, how, how great communism was. And just, he said, one after another, these pastors would get up, these rabbis would get up, these people would get up, and they just extol all the great things about communism and how they were excited to, to, for communism to be in Romania, all this stuff. And, and Sabina, at one point, she leans over to her husband and she says, I can't take any more. I want you to get up and wash this shame off the face of Christ. And he looks at her, he says, if I do, you're gonna lose your husband. And she says, I don't need a coward for a husband. Get up and do it, Okay. So he gets up and he just begins to lay out the history. He begins to lay out that, that our, our obedience to the Lord is, is front and center, number one, and that why the Christianity and communists are incompatible. Begin, people begin to clap and, and it like is this kind of uh, this, this great moment. A few weeks later, he's arrested and he's put into prison. He spends the next 14 years being tortured and beaten and suffering immeasurably for Christ. At the end of that 14 years, uh, at, the, at the preface of his book, he says, I came out of prison like a man who had been on a high mountain who could look around and see the valley and the beauty of the land below him. And coming down, I felt like I was coming down to the plains in just a more ordinary life. He knew that God had been faithful to him in that, throughout that entire time that God had, had used him powerfully to minister and God had shown him his glory and, and he, he saw it as such a gift to him in his life. Now, here's what I want to say to us is I can almost guarantee that no one in this room is being asked to lay down something as heavy as what Richard Wormbrand is on the altar. But in the same breath, I want to say every single person in this room is being asked to lay down something. You're being asked to risk something. You're being asked to take something and say, okay, God, I'm willing to count the cost. I'm willing to lay this down. And, and the question is, do you believe that God will be faithful to you? Do you believe that no matter what it is that God asks you to give, that God will reward you and that, it'll be good, that, that in the end, you'll be glad you did it. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells a parable of the talents. Remember, the, we get the word talent from this parable, but the, the, our word of like your abilities or your skills, um, but in, in this parable, it's gonna be in a unit of money. So it'll be like a thousand, you know, one talent is like a thousand dollars. It says, for it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. Immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more, but he who had received one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful for, with a few things. I will put you in charge over many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted me two talents. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. 
And the one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid, and I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered him and said, You wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to put my money in the bank. And on my arrival, I would have received back my money with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have the, an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness, and that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here, Jesus is describing himself. And on one hand, it's, it's juxtaposing two very different outcomes in what seems like two very different personalities. To the one he gives five talents, he, he invests it, he, he spends it, and he gets five more. And the Lord says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. I'm going to give you even more. Enter into the joy of your master. He's saying when we take our, the things that God has given us, we go out into the world, and we invest it, and we use it. It says that it honors God, that God desires them to give us more, and for us to share in the harvest, for us to share in, his, in this joyful life that he has for us. But the one that, that didn't do that, the one who was scared, the one who took it and he buried it, and he didn't do anything with it, is that he's, he has this confidence when the Lord comes, I said, look, I didn't lose it. I kept it. it. says that the Lord was displeased with him. And he takes it away, even what he has, and he gives it to another. Because one of the things that God's saying is, is, do you trust me? Do you have faith that as you go into the world, you have a loving father full of grace, Even if you make a mistake, even if you mess up, he's going to be there with you. But what you can't do is you can't believe that God is bad. You can't believe that God is is a a rigid taskmaster. You can't believe that God is, is, um, you can't approach God without faith. The Bible says, apart from faith, it's impossible to please God. So you have to trust that God is a rewarder of those who seek him. And so the one who, who buried his talent, the one who hid his talent, that one was disqualified. You know, that is an important warning for us because God has given you different strengths. He's given you different gifts. He's given you different talents. He's put you in different positions and he wants you to be full of faith. He wants you to trust that as you go risk something, as you go lay down your life in order to shine forth the good news of Jesus Christ, he wants you to trust him that he's going to be with you, that he's going to reward you. But if you don't, if you go and bury it, if you're quiet about it, if you hide it, it says that you're going to be disqualified and you're not going to enter into the joy of your master. You're not going to be, he's not going to share with you. You know, I think about something my grandma told me oftentimes. She said, it's bad advice. <laughs> she said, it's very rude to talk about religion. She had grown up in the South. She had grown up in Georgia in like the 1940s, 1950s. And she said, it, it, like, it's, it's, it's not polite to talk about religion. You know how crazy that is? That's totally unbiblical. That's the opposite of what the scriptures teach at all. What a, what a weird thing. And I was thinking about why it is that, that we have this kind of where, man, it feels like conversations about Christianity, conversations about spirituality, conversations about religion are not really welcome in the public sphere. And I was thinking, it's because, I think at least in part, it's a vestige of where our country has come from. One of the things that makes it so sad where we're at today is because we have such a great Christian heritage. It's not perfect, but so many parts of our country have been informed and shaped and molded by the Christian faith of those people who have gone before and laid the, the, the foundation for our society. And, and I guess at one point, if you were living in the Bible Belt like my grandma during the 1940s and everybody went to church, and the conversations you were having is like, well, what kind of Methodist are you, you know? And, and maybe if we're talking about little tiny things of doctrine. Maybe it is like, hey, let's not divide over that stuff. Let's not make, um, you know, non-essentials things that we're going to divide over. But that's not where we're at. You know, when you're sitting next to like a blue-haired, non-binary, he, her, she, shim, like (laughs) at that point, we're talking about religion, man. You're wearing your religion. I want to share my religion. We we need to be having these conversations. And it's, it's the, one of the ways, yeah. One of the ways we've gotten ourselves into this mess is that those people, those Christians who have gone before us, by and large, they didn't stand up when they should have stood up. They didn't speak out when they should have spoke out. There are moral imperatives that we should have been shouting from the rooftops for decades. And one of the problems that's happened is that the Christians, the faithful Christians who did shout those things off, they got marginalized, they got pushed out, they got quieted up. And there was a lot of Christians who just said, well, we don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to ruffle the feathers. We need to just 
try to, try to compromise and go along. And that's how we've gotten ourselves so far down the road that, we, that we're down. One of the things that, uh, in the book Letter to a Christian Nation that Eric Metaxas talks about, he talks about the spiral of silence. Neil's talked about this before, that, that the more we be quiet, the more it makes, hard, it makes it difficult to speak out. The more we keep it to ourselves, the more we don't tell the truth, the more, the more it costs for somebody to stand up and tell the truth. And so that's kind of where we're at. Where we're at is like, is like, it's really awkward, it's really uncomfortable, it's really unwelcome for Christians to stand up and say, look, this is wrong, this is what I believe. I'm a Christian, I'm, living, I'm letting my light shine, I'm not gonna be quiet about it. But you know that the opposite is also true, that courage is contagious. And that, that even the, the more you stay quiet, the harder it is for other Christians to speak up. The opposite is true, that the more you speak up, the easier it is for other Christians to speak up. Is that you are actually setting an example as you tell the truth, as you stand for what's good, as you stand for what's right. Not obnoxiously. Not, not People are going to take it as obnoxious. People are going to take it as rude. But as you speak the truth, as you display the love of God, as you shine forth the light of the gospel, it's going to make it easier and easier for other people to take a stand with you, for other people to speak up. And they, they might come to you and say, hey, I just want to say, I agree with what you said. Man, I, I think I, I really admire that. I want to know more or whatever it is. And then in different areas in their life, they're going to be emboldened. They're going to be encouraged for them to stand up and tell the truth. So you got to count the cost. Am I willing to walk by faith? Am I willing to trust God that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him? That if I, if I let my light shine, if I stand up, if I put my, my light on a, on a lampstand, if I'm a city set on a hill, in whatever it is the field that God's given me, am I trusting that God is going to reward me? That God is going to be with me? That, that, that even if something bad, you know, even if I'm risking my job or I'm risking something, God got me that job and God can get me another job. God gave me this money. God gave me these relationships. He can give me other relationships. He can lead me and he can be with me and he can have his way in my life. So, so first, you identify your field. Second, you count the cost. Third, then you just let your light shine. You know, Mark tells a powerful illustration about the difference between light and dark. They're not equally powerful, you know? When you are, are in your house at night and your house is all lit up and you go and you open your front door, it's not like darkness floods into your house, right? Light floods out. Light overcomes the darkness. Light is more powerful than darkness. Light is stronger than darkness. So we, have to have, we should have confidence that as we go to shine the light, it's the light that is going to overcome the darkness. It's not too equally powerful. It's not like you pass through your door and it's like, now I'm in the dark, right? It's like the light is going out further and further and further. That's how God intends it to be. He intends us to have our light overcome the world. So what does that look like? I want to invite the band out here. What does it look like for God, for us to shine our light? Well, the first thing it tells us is that let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So one of the first things is just your good works. You should let your good works shine. Now, this does not mean, there's, sometimes in the Bible it says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Don't parade around your self-righteousness, right? And, but then there's other times where it says, let your light shine so that people can see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I want to give you just a quick, easy test to know what's going on. Usually, if you want people to know about it, it's the kind of thing you should be quiet about. And then if you're nervous about doing it, it's usually the kind of thing you should do, okay? So, so this is not you, this is not us going out and being self-righteous and parading around all of our, oh, look at me, I'm doing so many great things. No, no, no. God is going to punish you for that. Don't do that. But if it's the kind of thing like, I'm nervous, I feel like um, I'm a little, I feel like it's going to cost me something. Maybe they're not going to be like, oh, that's so great, and everybody's going to be, you're so impressive. Um, that's probably usually the kind of thing you should let your light shine there. You should let your good deeds display God's glory, his honor, his goodness. And so one is just good deeds. A second thing, though, is a way to let your light shine is this through true words. Telling the truth, saying what is real, agreeing with God about what he says, about things in the world, about morality, about what is right, about what leads to happiness, about what leads to wholeness. Here's what you definitely cannot do. Sometimes it's hard to speak up and, and tell the truth, but here's what you're not, 
You absolutely cannot do You cannot repeat the lie. We need to stop as Christians going along with the world and agreeing. There's a lot of pressure right now to say the lie, to repeat the lie. God has called us to stand up for the truth. He's called us to speak the truth to lies, to speak the truth to the darkness. And so let our words be true. Another way you can let your light shine is by being led by the Spirit of God, by seeking God in your life, by by following him, by being a prayerful person, by, by the way you make your decisions in your life, be someone who is leaning and trusting in the Spirit of God. You know, if you're asking God, God, would you lead me? Would you teach me? Would you show me how I should do this or how I should move or where I should go? Would you open doors for me or not? People are going to recognize and they're going to say, that's not how I make decisions. That's a different way of living as being Spirit-led. You know, I think one of the ways that we can let our light shine is through our purity. And, and I think some of you in here, your light is not shining the way that it should because you have a spiritual eclipse going on in your life. There's impurity in your life and you know that people know it and so you feel like I should just be quiet because I don't want to be a hypocrite, I don't want to speak out. Because you know your life does not match up with what you, what you believe. I just want to say, this: look, repent, get right with God. He's inviting you to come and be cleansed. You confess your sin to him. You repent and turn to him. He will wash you clean no matter what it is that you've done. And then you can go out and your light can shine guilt-free, shame-free. That's how he intends us to be living. Here's, here's kind of how it looks. Here's, in my mind, I, I, how, how I imagine it looks like for us. Is it when you wake up in the morning or on your drive to work or as you pull into your kid's Little League game or you're planning to get together with your family or hanging out with your friends, before you get there, you just ask, how can I bring the Lordship of Jesus Christ to this, this thing I'm gonna do? Lord, Lord, I, I present myself before you and say, God, I wanna, I wanna think about how can I bring God's Lordship to this situation? Now, look, you don't have to land the plane, okay? It doesn't, the, the, the family dinner doesn't have to end with everybody on their knees confessing and repenting and turning to the Lord, okay? Maybe I'm just going to water the field. Maybe I'm just going to pull some weeds. Maybe I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm not, I'm not going to do, I'm, I'm going to let my light shine. I'm going to be an encouragement to these people. So, so maybe I'm going to, I'm going to go to work and I'm going to say, God, how can I glorify you today? To, to one of my employees, my subordinates, I'm going to say, how can I encourage them? How can I bring God's encouragement to them? If you're a stay-at-home mom, can I, can I invite over a younger mom and share some of my wisdom, some of the things that I've learned with her? Maybe you're a dad who, maybe your house is out of order. And maybe one of the ways you're gonna let your light shine is you're just gonna invite over an older Christian man who you trust, who you, who you look up to, and you say, hey, can you just give me some advice here? I feel like there's some things, that, can, you, can you help me do this better? You know what a light that is to your family, to your field? As a husband, to, to humble yourself and say, I want to grow here. I want to get better. Maybe you're on a PTA or you got your kids' little league or, or soccer games, and you just say, man, as we go here, I'm going to be an example to these other families. Maybe there's a kid that you really kind of don't really want your kid to be friends with. Why don't you invite them over? Let them see what a Christian family's like. Let them see you just pray before meals, and, and when kids get in trouble, you're not demeaning or shaming them, but you're, you're, you're restoring them. There's so many, the question is, what is your field? It might cost you something, but, but let's take a step of faith. Let's invite people to see the goodness of God, to taste and see, to experience the love of God. My hope is that that's what we'll be doing. You know, as we go out here um, today, we're gonna have a bunch of those balloons and those invitations. Maybe that's just, I can, I can almost guarantee you, one of your fields is your neighborhood. Why don't I just, as a step of faith, saying, okay, I'm gonna... I don't, know why, I don't know why anyone in here would throw it on the roof. I don't know what Dave's talking about there, but it was weird. Um, but why don't you take one of those and just say, okay, we're going to take two, take three, take four. We're going to give these to our neighbors and we're going to say, hey, uh, Easter's coming up and we would just love it if you guys would join us. We're going to this service. If you guys want to come along, we think that'd be great. doesn't have to be weird. They could just say, hey, we care about you. We thought about you. We want to invite you to come and find out what the light's about. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we love you, God. We, don't, we want to trust, Lord, that you're a rewarder. That, God, as we obey you, 
we can move forward with the confidence of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, God. We can move forward, Lord, with the confidence that the God of the universe, the maker of heaven and earth, has our back, is with us. And Lord, we want our light to shine so that people might see the light and glorify you and honor you and praise you and worship you, God. 